found in also Rule 301 and Subdivision E. Uh, the electronic tool that you guys use to submit your report will already have that loaded in, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, as I said before, AB 2588 facilities, the quadrennial report, uh, the longer list of toxics that need to be reported will be subject to those facilities that are in phase three. Um, this is another big one, uh, CARBS, Criteria Pollutant and Toxics Emission Reporting Regulation. I know a lot of you had questions on the state's requirements and their newly adopted reg back in December. Um, we are implementing that or administering that for the state. And so changes you'll see in our reporting tool are just identifiers for facilities that are subject to that state reg uh, and also a checkbox for data confidentiality. Uh, as far as all the other required information in a report, um, based off of CARB's reg, our system is already set to be in compliance if you submit through our tool. So as long as you're reporting as you've done in previous years, you should be in compliance with the state, but always check back. Uh, you can go to their website, arb.california.gov. Um, if you go to this link on our website, our webpage, we have links there that will take you to their website. Um, but right, so it just go ahead and you can call us for some basic questions, but if you have specific questions, make sure you call the state. This is uh, the field I was talking about. If you are identified or tagged as an AB 617 uh, facility, you'll see a check mark there and then the reason why. Um, just really quickly, the requirements that would trigger whether or not you're subject to the state reg would be if you are in the state's mandatory reporting regulation or if you exceed over 250 tons per year uh, potential to emit for uh, your criteria pollutants and their precursors. Uh, if your facility is categorized as a high priority facility under AB 2588. Uh, and the fourth one is something that's still being worked on at the state level. So again, if you have questions on, on that, you can call us for general questions, but uh, for detailed questions, you probably wanna contact the state. Okay, so the reporting process. Um, you can go on to our webpage at aqmd.gov, the link's here uh, under AER, uh, which provides you all the instructions. There's a lot of guidelines, guidance documents on how to calculate emissions, uh, frequently asked questions. Um, and so make sure you look at that before you start the reporting process. Uh, then when you get into the tool, uh, you will be basically filling out four main categories in the reporting tool. Uh, the first of which is completing your facility information. Uh, you're going to have to list all the fuels or the fuels you've combusted in the calendar year that's in question. Uh, this year it's for 2018. Uh, you're gonna have to define all your emission sources. Uh, for those of you who have reported previously, that will still be there, your information for your previous emission sources that you've loaded up. Um, so there's an upload feature for that, but. Uh, Monty Ferozian will be going over that when he gets through the demonstration. Um, and again, lastly, reporting all the processes and also the associated emissions with the emission sources. Okay, so after that's all done in the reporting tool, um, make sure you review your data and your calculations. Um, any supporting documentation that you may be using for emission factors or um, MSDSs, SDSs, make sure that's also being uploaded into the tool. Uh, there's a feature in the tool where you can run data validation. So you can go through the whole report, fill out all the different fields that it's required, and at the end you press the data validation button and it'll tell you if there's anything that you did incorrectly or possibly if there's anything that you had missed. Um, after all that's done, you will be taken to a page where you could submit your report. It'll give you emission summaries, uh, what the fees are if, if you have triggered or went over the thresholds for the caps or tax. Um, and please make sure you keep all your copies, uh, including your completed submittal for your records in case uh, our staff has questions for you or in the event of an audit or possibly an amendment to your report. Okay, so we'll go over a couple of frequently asked questions. Um, a lot of people ask, well, what type of emissions am I supposed to report? Well, again, permitted equipment 
both permit and non-permitted -permit equipment uh, needs to be reported. Uh, that even includes your portable sources um, and also Rule 219 equipment. Uh, emissions that should not be reported, any uh, mobile source equipment, both on-road and off-road, uh, any equipment that's registered under the state's uh, PERP program or a portable um, engine, I'm sorry, state registered portable equipment, uh, also architectural coatings, we're talking about coatings that you use on uh, stationary or fixtures like your buildings, uh, utility equipment, lawn mowers, leaf blowers, that kind of stuff does not need to be reported, uh, clean air solvents, which uh, have zero emissions, and also uh, for registration equipment, non-combustion char rollers and defat fryers operated at restaurants are also not required to be reported. Uh, as far as VOCs go, they, we also have some exempt materials that are in Rule 102, so you'll want to make sure that you're checking for, for that when you're looking at VOC emissions. Uh, going back to the submittal, uh, again, after you put everything on the tool, uh, you will be, uh, come, you'll come to a page at the very end or a section where you could print out your signature sheet, um, fees due summary, all your summaries for both your criteria and your toxic emissions, uh, a submittal confirmation that you've actually submitted electronically, uh, and then again, a check if only you are subject to fees, and that's again if you trigger or go over the thresholds for either your criteria or your toxic emissions. Uh, and then there's also a facility status update page which goes over change of ownership or is there anything that's been done differently, you wanna tag your facility as a different status, uh, make sure that it's also printed out and sent in. Uh, a lot of people ask if emissions can be paid for uh, online rather than through a check which is possible. So after you go to the last page that we talked about in the reporting tool, uh, you'll be able to print out your fee summary and if you contact billing services, uh, you can just send an email and let them uh, give a picture or, or a copy of the invoice. Um, billing services will get back to you and give you an invoice that you can reference. And then after you receive this, you can go on our online fee payment uh, link on our website and include the uh, invoice number, uh, and after you pay online, you will also receive a confirmation which you should keep for your records. Okay, so it's supporting documentation, I went over that really quickly on a previous slide, but if you're using any type of emission factor that's not the default emission factors loaded in the tool, uh, and this may vary between SEMS, approved source tests, uh, SDSs, you should always be using the most accurate uh, emission factor. So if you have something that reflects that, then make sure you're using that, but you have to provide the documentation. There is an upload feature that Monty will be going over, and so uh, he'll show you where that's done, but make sure you're doing that. Um, and again, if you have any questions on other types of things that you may need or be able to upload, uh, you can refer to our help and support section on our AAR webpage. Records uh, should be kept for at least five years. Uh, there are a lot of different programs, specifically, let's say like the Tile 5 program I referenced before, that requires facilities to keep records for at least five years. Uh, for us, it's not that we get back to you. Sometimes you may look at your report a couple years after you submitted it, so make sure you keep all your records in the event that uh, your facility gets audited or if you need to make changes to your report um, so we have some type of proof or some type of record that we can kind of check against. Okay, so there are a lot of different program supports uh, for this program. Again, you can go on our webpage, um, on our website, AQMD, there's a specific webpage for AER. Uh, we also have a link for the help and support manual. Uh, you can email us at AER at AQMD.gov for any questions. Uh, also, we have a hotline that we operate and so if you have questions, our whole team uh, is available every day, uh, Tuesday through Friday, to answer questions. And if it's after hours, you can leave a message and we'll get back to you uh, as soon as we get the message. Um, AB2588 facilities, there's also support for that. So if you are AB2588 facility, just pay attention to both those email hotline numbers. 
Okay, so with that, uh, that concludes just the brief program overview. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to our senior AQ engineer, Monty Ferosian, who will give a live demonstration of the AAR reporting tool. Good morning. Uh, for the next uh, few slides, I stick to the PowerPoint and we jump into the reporting tool. Um, all right. <clears throat> so I guess brief overview of how our uh, reporting tool operates. Um, our, uh, the reporting tool is set up uh, such that uh, you report emissions uh, by uh, devices. And it's worthy to uh, mention that uh, there is a small uh, you know, definition that, that needs to be clarified on. When uh, you receive a permit for your operations, uh, uh, sometimes a few devices get aggregated and permitted as a permitted unit. Uh, we have a good example here for a printing operation that a dryer and a printing press are aggregated and permitted as one permitted unit. But when it comes to reporting your annual emission reporting, you need to report those separately. In fact, we upload uh, first year that you report to our program we upload your entire permit profile into the reporting tool and assign a emission source ID to them. So it's going to be ready for you, but you got to keep that in mind that those need to be reported separately. Um, big overview of uh, you know, sections of the reporting tool uh, as you enter, which I'll be uh, showing you shortly. There's a facility information section. Uh, there is a space uh, or you know section. Uh, for uh, you to uh, define all the emission sources you have and uh, provide information for those. Of course, emission reporting section. And the tool has a validation section that uh, checks to see if information was uh, reported correctly. And if you pass the validation, a submission button will appear and you can submit the report. Without passing the validations, you're not gonna be able to submit. Um, we try to categorize the emission sources to help reporters uh, um, uh, report, uh, to make reporting easier uh, for the reporters, and uh, also it helps us to build some features into the reporting tool to uh, uh, allow uh, the user, uh, to allow the user to uh, uh, pick the default emission factors and so on and so forth. So these uh, classifications are as uh, following. External combustion sources, internal combustion sources, spray coating and spray booth. Uh, other use of organic, I would like to emphasize that this is anything but spray uh, coating and spray booths because we have a category for that. Um, storage tanks, um, our tool is capable of uh, 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 accepting data from a EPA uh, tank software, which I'll uh, um, explain more in details. Fugitive components, uh, if you're subject to uh, uh, you know, one of our uh, fugitive emission regulations, uh, 462, 1173, 1176, um, it helps you to report your fugitive components and leaks. Uh, other processes is basically a section for you. If none of the above uh, apply, you can use this uh, uh, category. And last but not least is uh, process offset. If you have spills, startup shutdowns, you can use that category. And uh, as far as uh, process uh, emission uh, data entry, I'll be explaining this in more details. Um, sometimes for the same device, you have different type of throughputs. Let's say in, in case of a spray booth, you may have different type of paints. So the tool allows you to report those separately still under the same reporting, uh, same uh, uh, emission uh, uh, source or device, if you will. And, um, here are some of the features of the uh, AER reporting tool. It allows you to uh, import last year uh, report configuration. So the first year that you report and upload all your emission factors and set up the tool, next year it's gonna be easier. You can just upload your whole configuration from the previous year and update the throughput and you're good to go. Um, it also uh, has uh, allows you, as I indicated, to add uh, one process, at least one process to each device. And uh, we'll talk about adding process in more details when I uh, go through the demonstration uh, phase of my presentation. 
And um, also it allows you to categorize your equipment as permitted versus non-permitted, and it allows you to see the total emission numbers for permitted and non-permitted devices. Um, it, uh, it's intuitive. It does uh, some unit conversion for you, so you don't have to do uh, those type of calculations out of the tool. Uh, also, in one snapshot, you're gonna see all your criteria toxic and greenhouse gas emissions. Um, it also, um, as I indicated, uh, it has some of our default emission factors built in, so you can select those. Um, uh, it has a great feature. Uh, Eugene uh, briefly touched on the record keeping uh, requirements. Um, it allows you to upload your supporting documents, so that's one thing we recommend to the reporters to take advantage of. So whatever supporting document you use for your reporting purposes, you can just upload to the tool, and tool will keep it for you, so you can always know where to access it. If you're reporting emissions from uh, uh, storage tanks, there is a software uh, by EPA called Tanks. Um, to make it easier on the reporter, we built a feature in our tool that allows you to do your calculations, perform all the calculations in tank software, and generate a file, upload it to the file, and it gets populated into the tool so you don't have to manually enter the data. It allows you to sort the data, add any comments that you may have. If you uh, need to uh, stop in the middle of the process, uh, it allows you to save all the changes and uh, basically work that you did in the tool. It has a, a basic feature to calculate greenhouse gas emissions for uh, default emission factors under California Resources Board Mandatory Reporting Regulation Program. And um, this is, I would like to emphasize that this is sort of a back of an envelope calculations. It's a you know, starting point for you to determine if you're uh, subject to that program. Detail applicability requirements might be more detailed calculations, which is beyond the uh, feature that we have here, but it's a good starting point. And um, also there are summary sections that I'll be touching on when I uh, demonstrate the tool. Um, now for the demonstration, I guess uh, for next few slides, again, I stick to the PowerPoint. Um, this is the snapshot from the uh, main page of the tool where you log in. Um, if it's the first time you're reporting, you need to create a, a user account. And once you have that, you can always log in. So um, as you see, if you're new, there's a register here. When you press that button, it's gonna prompt you to this page where you enter your contact information, select the user and password. And once you press the submit there, it's gonna show you this uh, confirmation uh, that uh, provides you your um, um, you know, email address that you use and whatnot. So I get a lot of uh, phone calls uh, reporters cannot remember the uh, user ID that they used, and this is one thing that we cannot change, so make sure when you type in your user ID and email address, it's correct. And uh, once, uh, after creating your user ID, you're gonna receive a confirmation email. This is, a, again, a second step that a lot of reporters or first-time reporters miss. Once you register, you need to go to the email account that you provided the address for, and uh, look for this email and click on the link to activate your account. Without activating your account, you're not gonna be able to use your uh, user ID. But if you run into problems, you can always call the hotline, we can help you out. If you forget your password, similar to any uh, email account that you have, uh, you can go to basically the main page here. There is a blue link, uh, reset your password. Um, you click on that, it's gonna prompt you to this page um, where it's, uh, your, uh, the user is asked to provide the email address that was used for the account. Uh, you enter the uh, username or you know, email address, and if, it's, uh, if it recognizes it, um, basically go to the next page, or I mean uh, the page after this one. But if it doesn't recognize it, you get that error message that the email address is not in our record. So make sure you type in uh, your uh, email address correctly, in case that you know you um, enter it correctly, it's gonna send you an email with a temporary, uh, uh, or actually a link to your account, where if you press on that link, it's gonna prompt you to a page where you can reset your password and take it from there. So now I'd like to uh, switch to the actual reporting tool and uh, I'll walk you through how the tool works. Right, 
So I'm going to use uh, login with the user, the test user ID that I have. So when you uh, create your user account and uh, log in, it's going to prompt you to this page. So user account is for you to use. And uh, if you have the facility ID and the PIN number for the facility that you're reporting for, you can log into that facility profile. So basically, with your user account, if you have this information for any facility in our basin, you can log into their account. So that's why we always recommend, if you're using consulting service, um, when you share your uh, Facility ID and PIN number, everybody can access your uh, report and your facility report. So be cautious uh, who you share it with, and um, if you need the PINs to be reset, uh, you need to let us know. So I'm going to log into uh, the account that, uh, or a facility that uh, we created for the test purposes. So once you log into the facility page, um, you're going to see the whole history for the facility. I guess in this, as I indicated, it's a, a test facility. You're going to see all the previous year reports. If the previous reports are submitted, it's going to show submitted here and the date it was submitted. I guess in this case, because it's a test facility, none of the previous reports were submitted. And um, to report now, I guess uh, for this year reporting, we need to report 2018. To access that page or that report, you click open in front of 2018. If you don't see 2018 here, that means that we didn't add your facility uh, to our reporting tool and probably you haven't received a notice from us. If uh, you think that that was a mistake and you need to report and you uh, uh, trigger the reporting thresholds, yeah, you need to contact us, we can have your facility added. So once you click open, um, uh, it uh, gives you a uh, few options on this page. So the first one uh, is, uh, as I indicated, you can import from the last year. And by pressing this uh, button, the tool is going to go and uh, basically pull your uh, last year configuration and uh, paste it, if you will, to uh, the current uh, reporting year. One thing you need to be cautious of if you started the process and you come to this page, you press this uh, uh, you know, link or button by mistake, of course, it's going to ask you if you're really sure you want to proceed. It's going to overwrite whatever you did for 2018. So basically, this uh, link, in the beginning, you press it once and you're done, unless you want to basically reset everything. So be cautious of that. And um, if you come back to this page and uh, you want to, um, um, you know, you want to start from scratch, or there is no previous year, you need to press start here, which is going to prompt you to the next page. It's not going to go and upload from the previous year. So that's what I'm going to do. I um, I have some uh, devices already uploaded, uh, so I'm going to skip that uh, step uh, because I would like to uh, keep uh, the demonstration uh, demonstration. Uh, section of the presentation short so you can uh, have time with the staff on that one-on-one, -on -one, um, I guess, uh, with the computers. So uh, Eugene kind of covered this uh, facility information, self-exploratory. Um, you um, Most of this information and this uh, snapshot are pre-populated by us. If you come across you know, errors, discrepancies, contact us, we can fix it. Um, again, equipment address is uh, pre-populated. Um, I suggest, actually, um, not suggest, you need to always you know, make sure all this information uh, are correct. So always go through this uh, uh, facility information section. Uh, make sure your uh, NACS and SIC codes are correct. And uh, if you need to look them up, there are two links for you that uh, will uh, route you to a web page for these associations that you can look up your, uh, I guess, uh, codes for your type of operations. 
for a case of this example, I, uh, I'm uh, reporting for auto body shop and industry type, I selected auto body shop. Um, one thing um, I always uh, you know, emphasize on every year, the facility operating status is blank. That's why you need to always come to this page and uh, make sure everything is updated. I'm gonna leave it blank so you'll see what happens. But uh, this is one of the validation errors you're gonna get at the end. Um, there are some check boxes here. I'm not gonna go through the detail of them. Um, we indicated that our tool uh, has a, a capability of calculating greenhouse gas for the combustion sources. And uh, in order to activate that, you need to check this box. And it asks you if you're sure you wanna add uh, greenhouse gas calculations. And then it asks for some additional information, your uh, air resources, California Air Resources Board, uh, greenhouse gas ID and EPA ID and so on and so forth. And uh, if you click it, it's gonna calculate all the cal uh, emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, and if you unclick it, all of those calculations are gonna disappear. So I guess for the sake of uh, our demonstration, I'm gonna keep it uh, off. Uh, if you generate uh, electricity, check this boxes, it prompts you to another page to report some additional information about your generation ca capabilities and type of facility you are. Um, if you're subject to uh, uh, fugitive emission uh, requirements under uh, rule 1173, 1176, you need to check this box. We have detailed guidelines for facilities that are subject to these programs because um, their uh, emission calculations will be more detailed. And there's a guideline at AER tool that tells you how to report if you're subject to those two programs. Uh, if you're a small business, you need to check this box. That, that uh, prompts us to uh, look into your report, see if there are any exemptions that you may be, uh, um, that may apply to you. I uh, briefly talked about uh, startup and shutdown emissions. Usually, um, you may get different permit limits for your startup and shutdown uh, uh, of your processes. Sometimes emissions are higher in those stages. So, um, we um, we ask facilities to report those emissions separately because uh, that may, if you just uh, aggregate that emissions with the normal operations, it may uh, result in confusion down the line when your, our compliance department looks at your report and you're um, exceeding your permit limits for normal operations. But for you to report that, you need to check this box. Otherwise, you're not gonna see the other sections that uh, um, I guess uh, allows you to report that emissions. Again, if you have question about that, we can talk about it after the uh, presentation. I'm gonna keep it off, but I can walk you through how to report it if you have questions about it. Um, this is um, uh, where you report your preparer and authorize a facility representative for the sake of uh, this uh, training. We check them to be the same as the main facility contact, but you can report different uh, uh, people there. I got uh, some requests from uh, some facilities that forgot to update this, so keep that in mind before pressing the submit button. Uh, make sure all the contact information are right because the reporting tool gets locked once you press the submit button. Uh, data confidentiality is a new feature for this year. Um, if you wanna claim any data as confidential, you need to check this box and provide explanation. Um, um, or you know, why you're claiming that information uh, confidential. I would like to uh, emphasize that emissions data is not confidential, so you cannot claim emission data as confidential. So always press save, and it's gonna show you that that page is successfully saved. I'm gonna go to the next page, uh, which is the status update. This uh, page allows you to claim if your facility is shut down, if your emissions are uh, you know, reduced significantly, and any of these check boxes that you click on, it's gonna um, open a box for you to explain, and you need to explain why you're claiming that. Um, I guess I'm not gonna claim any of these because we wanna report emissions, save it, next. Um, the way the tool is set up, if you're reporting combustion sources, you need to define your fuel types. If you don't report the fuels in this page, they're not gonna appear down the line when you report emissions. So I get a lot of calls that facilities don't see any fuels getting populated in the remission report section. This is the place that you need to define the, um, uh, the type of fuel that uh, you'll be uh, combusting. So 
I just add a field that wasn't added. Uh, let's say I call it process associated gas. And it uh, populates the pi value as default and I'm gonna save it. So now I have three fuels down the line when I report combustion. I'm gonna see all these three fuels there listed. This is the emission uh, sources page. It allows you to see all the emission sources that you have in the reporting tool um, when you start reporting. There are a couple of features. If you're reporting uh, EPA, uh, if you're using EPA tanks to report uh, uh, emissions from your tanks, um, by clicking uh, this link, it's gonna ask you to uh, locate the EPA uh, file that that software generates and upload the information here. Again, uh, that doesn't apply to a lot of facilities, so we're not gonna go through the details of that. So right now I have uh, multiple devices uh, uh, already set up. One thing I would like to emphasize is uh, here you can sort uh, your equipment based on application number. That's a neat feature that I briefly touched on. But um, I guess if you have some devices that uh, are not in operation, um, let me add a new device and then we'll go through it. You can claim it as being shut down or not in operation. So the tool in the next step is gonna, not going to ask you for emission reporting or throughput information. So I'm going to add a new device. Um, usually, I guess, uh, for the sake of uh, training, it's uh, easier. Um, or I can touch on a lot of different uh, aspects uh, with the spray boots. Um, how many of you are reporting spray boots? OK, so I guess that's a good thing to select. So um, when you're adding, a, when the device is not pre-populated, um, let's say it's a permitted device, and uh, um, what you're selecting for the first time, it allows you to pick the, uh, you know, permit information. So it's a permitted device, I checked that. Uh, as you see uploaded, it's not gonna allow you. Uploading is for us, not for the reporter. When we upload, that is checked. So that way you know that you, you cannot really control the application number and uh, permit information associated with that device. And then it uh, pre-populates for you all the uh, application numbers that are uh, associated with your permit. If it's a new device, let's say that we didn't catch, um, you press add new. I'm gonna um, put like a permit number and you, you can obtain all this information from your uh, air permits. And um, the, the, the tool is gonna assign an emission source ID for it uh, automatically, but sometimes uh, the description that you have in your permit or um, um, an ID the tool generates is not something that you're going to be familiar with. If you have a basically, a, you know, 250 uh, uh, million BTU hour boiler and it's a John Zinc and that's the only John Zinc you want to call it John Zinc, you can, this area is going to allow you to uh, enter a name, uh, a, a custom name um, for uh, that boiler. Um, so I guess in this case, I'll be reporting spray boot, so I'll call it let's say, SAP. So it's, it's for you to remember what device you have in there. Um, the tool allows you to, um, um, as I indicated, uh, claim what the status of that uh, device is. Um, if you want to report a mission, you call it normal operation. Sometimes you may uh, that device may not generate emissions. You can call it not generating emissions, or it may not be in operation, or you may have shut it down. Or, you know, um, it might be duplicated. Sometimes you have five boilers uh, uh, exhausting to one single stack, and then you want to capture emission under the stack. You can call those duplicate and capture emissions um, under the stack. So this basically allows you, uh, the simple interpretation of these statuses are, are you gonna be reporting emissions on the report emissions section or not? So because that's what I'm gonna do, um, I'm gonna uh, select normal operation. So by selecting that, the tool in the report emission reporting section is gonna ask you for emission data and throughput and so on and so forth. If let's say if it's shut down, if you claim it as shut down, it's not gonna ask for emissions because shut down equipment is not gonna generate emissions in ideal world. And if you wanna, um, Claim any comments uh, um, uh, for yourself, uh, 
how you define it, why you define it, you can enter it here. Um, you need to categorize the emission source. Again, these are the categories that I touched on in, uh, in the slides. So we're gonna report a spray booth. I'm gonna fix, uh, I'm gonna check that. It's gonna uh, prompt me to uh, two options, open a spray, spray booth. Uh, I'm gonna select the spray booth and save it. And uh, design capacity, um, anything with asterisk you need to, you require to report. Anything without it, I guess it's optional for you to remember. So when you're done defining your uh, piece of equipment, you have three options here. Of course you wanna save, but after saving, what would you like to do? Some uh, reporters like to uh, define the source and go and report it and get it done with. Uh, some like to first create their all the sources profile and report emissions all together. So these are the options here. Save is gonna just save it. Save and return to list of emission sources is gonna prompt you back to the list of all the emission sources you have for those people that like to first define all their sources first. And if you're one of the uh, reporters that like to report, uh, define and report uh, emission for devices in one step, uh, you, you'll be uh, selecting this, which I guess uh, that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna just proceed to report emissions. So, <clears throat> excuse me. We talked about processes. So as I indicated, sometimes a, um, emission source uh, can have different type of throughput. You have a boiler, it runs on refinery fuel gas, natural gas. Um, the emission factors that you'll be using to calculate emissions for all these are different. So these, although it's the same device, they need to be disaggregated based on the fuel. That's the whole idea behind the process. Um, it's the same with the uh, spray booth. Um, emission uh, calculation for a spray booth is mostly based on the paint, the type of paint you use. So different paint, you're gonna generate different type of emissions, so there was a need for disaggregating these and giving flexibility to the reporter. That's the whole idea behind process under emission source. I guess in uh, this case, um, by default, you're gonna have one process when I open it, and as you see, you can add other processes here. Let's define one process together. When I press that, it's gonna prompt me to this page, which is basically, you're gonna define your process further, you're gonna report the throughput, calculate the criteria emissions, and toxic emissions. If you uh, selected greenhouse gas to be calculated, you're gonna have another box down here for greenhouse gases, which I guess in this case, that's, uh, I guess that's up to you. We don't require that information to be reported to us, so I didn't add it. Um, process name, I guess uh, it can be a primer. As I said, these are not required. Um, it's just, uh, I'm not gonna add any comments. And it, as uh, we indicated, it's intuitive based on the type of category of the uh, emission source you pick. It's gonna give you the options that uh, uh, applies to that. So I guess um, I'm gonna select it to be coating type of operation. It was motor vehicle or you know, auto body shop. Um, application, uh, basically any of these, and it's gonna basically prompt you to transfer efficiency, which we're gonna see shortly. I'm gonna uh, put the HVLP application and primer. Uh, material description, I guess, this type of primer, you may enter the name that manufacturer used, I just randomly use this. Um, for the um, spray coating operations, it automatically assigns a rule to that type of device if you wanna add additional rules that are applicable, or if you're reporting any type of other devices that default rule wasn't selected, it's, it's gonna show you a, an open box here with the link to add rule. And when you click on that, let's say, uh, it lists uh, some of the uh, rules that uh, seem to be applicable for that type of device. You need to at least add one rule. But I guess in this case, for uh, spray boots, it's additional. That's why you don't see an asterisk here. But I added one rule there. And then your throughput, 
and gallons, be careful with the units you use because this drop down menu allows you to uh, uh, use uh, the unit that is applicable to the number you're reporting. Um, criteria emissions, um, usually with the spray boots you have, depending on the type of paint you're using, uh, you can have VOC emissions and particulate matter emissions. So I'm gonna add VOC emission factor, I guess in this case for just sake of example I put one. And then you can add uh, any overall control efficiency if you will, um, because uh, your spray boot controls VOC. And we have uh, default uh, values for these, we have a guideline for uh, use of organics on our website, which gives you all the defaults that you can use for a type of devices that you use to spray. Um, let's say I put uh, 90%. And then you get a disclaim where you got the emissions uh, emission factors from. So I would say um, uh, MSDS, now I guess uh, it's referred to, we used to call them material safety data sheets, now I guess they refer to them safety data sheets. It's the same thing. And uh, for the emission factor comments, also you can, if you like, you can uh, enter a comment about where you obtained that, uh, or when you uh, got that uh, overall control efficiency here. And uh, I added VOC, now I'm gonna, let's say, uh, add toxics. Usually, keep that in mind, look at the safety data sheets. There are some, uh, they give you a list of compounds that are used in that type of paint usually makes sense for a paint to have toxics, and that's not you know, all the times, but um, check your safety data sheet. Make sure you report everything. Because when we audit, that's the first thing that we look at if you're not reporting any toxic for the facility, something is wrong. And let's say I added benzene here, and I put it again. Emission factor, Overall efficiency, because this is a VOC, this needs to be consistent with what you reported for uh, VOC, which I entered uh, 90%. And again, this is, can be a, um, I put engineering evaluation. You may have to do some engineering calculations to determine that emission factor. Um, I'm gonna also add a metal here. Let's say, um, it's a, you know, PM, uh, metals are particulate matter. As you notice, I didn't define uh, PM in the previous uh, step because I want you to see how the validation error is gonna occur. You're reporting a toxic, which is a particulate matter, but you didn't report on any particulate matter. So it's gonna flag it. Um, solid content, um, again, I'm gonna put some uh, numbers. Um, Transfer efficiency, when you spray a, a, a coating material that has PM in it, um, you need to capture how much of the paint that you're spraying is gonna be transferred to the piece of, uh, um, I guess, equipment that you're uh, painting or spraying. So all these, again, defaults, you can use default here, which is basically gonna go see what type of uh, spray. We were using HVLP, um, so it's gonna go and pick the default for that. And then overall control efficiency, that's one thing you enter. You can use default, but one thing with the defaults, I recommend all the reporters, if you're using default, you can always go to our guidelines. Make sure you know where the default is coming from. Because sometimes you may have made, made a mistake somewhere when you were defining your process and you were not aware of it, and you press the default, it's gonna pick a default. And let's say you, you're, you're having HEPA filters, which are the best rose roses of you know, filters but because you didn't pick it, here it's gonna pick 90% and your emission is gonna be way more than what you're actually, uh, what you're uh, permitted to emit. And that's gonna create confusions. So make sure you know where these defaults are coming from and you know, always for the first time that you're reporting, go to the guidelines, make sure the default is what is indicated for your type of operations. So again, I'm gonna put 9999. Four nine, okay. And again, same thing, emission data. I'm gonna put uh, AQMD rule limit, or let's say AQMD default. So when I save it, so I think I reported everything here now. Um, and I have, if I go back to emission sources, 
Um, it's going to ask me if I want to add any process, any other process. Let me see. I'm going to add. Um, that's for the same device. Process name, I guess. Because when you have, uh, when you do, uh, you know, spray uh, paint, it's going to be um, basically, you know, you have primary, you have, the, you know, coating material. So I'm going to keep this, uh, you know. Do go through this really quickly so you'll see all of them. HBRT. I'm not going to add any <clears throat> toxic. So I defined the two processes for this spray booth. But you can have as many as processes you would like. So um, if I go back to emission sources, these links let you just jump into different stages of the report. They are like shortcuts. Uh, so I have uh, a couple devices that were there, which I guess uh, uh, put them in there and you know define them before this demonstration, this is the one that we just added. And so let me skip these, I'll go to the data validation. I, uh, I guess I recommend, um, you know, looking that um, through the whole process, you may see a lot of validation errors, but you can basically monitor, review your work uh, along the way. So when I run the data validation, it's gonna give me some validations. As you see, some of them are for ES18, and one is for the facility information. There, there's a link provided here. If you click on it, it's basically, you can read the uh, explanation here that tells you what is wrong. And by clicking on this link, it's gonna take you to that spot in the report that you missed something. So that's what I'm gonna do. So remember in the beginning of demonstration, I told you I'm gonna leave this intentional blank which is basically facility information may remain the same, but your operation status, we don't know if you were operating that year, so that gets deleted every year, so you need to go update that. So I'm gonna check that as operating, always save. Now I guess if I go to data validation, run it again, that first one disappeared. And this one, I guess, remember, uh, I added a toxic PM, and I didn't add it the PM, so it's basically telling you about that. Um, and if I go there, I need to add a PM. And here's default, here's default. And also I gotta make sure that it's consistent with what I have here. I'm gonna pick default here, so it would be consistent. These two, uh, transfer efficiency and control efficiency for the PM and that metal should be consistent. So now data validation, okay. Okay, so basically in uh, that case, if I go to that validation error, sometimes you see errors, they're in red. With errors, you cannot pass beyond um, this stage, it's not gonna let you submit. But there are warnings. Warning is basically FYI, you did this, but you may have done it that way, there was a reason for it. This is the case, so the, the main coding that I added for just because I wanted to quickly go through that stage, I didn't add any PM for it. So the tool is gonna ask you, hey, you didn't report any PM for that you know, main code that uh, you're spraying or you're reporting, do you wanna add PM for it? In this case, you may say, no, there is no you know, particulars, I look at my safety data sheet, there is no solid content, hypothetically. So basically, I'm gonna basically live with that validation error because it's a warning. Um, summaries, um, it's a good uh, way for you to, uh, you know, before going through validation or any time through the stage to review your work. Uh, if you click on it, it shows you um, how much emission for each of the categories, default categories we talked about, your uh, reporting. This is the you know, good area that you can easily catch uh, misplacing decimal points. 
let's say if you're a small body shop and reporting 20 tons of VOC, something might be wrong. And you may have put the wrong decimal points when you were reporting throughput or emission factors. You can catch those type of mistakes here. And if, I, if you click on any of these emissions, there's a link, there's a blue link. It tells you exactly what sources these emission numbers are coming from. So you can even go beyond the total and see and you know, basically spot any errors, if you will. And it's a good way for your uh, superiors to uh, review your work as well. You may want to share that with them. Same thing with toxic, in addition to a link that tells you where all those uh, emission numbers are coming from or aggregated here based off. It also shows you how much of your fees are calculated or toxic fees are calculated based on the emissions that you're reporting. Probably that might be something that your boss cares about more, how much it's going to cost as far as fees. But. And uh, I guess uh, last uh, summary page would be your total uh, emissions and total fees uh, for this facility. So um, it gives you a breakdown of the criteria. If you have any toxic fees that was you know, broken down in the toxic fee page here, it's going to add the totals here. Um, for facilities that generate more than 10 tons of criteria pollutants, we uh, usually send them an invoice for half of the previous year emissions. That's what installments are referring to. If you're not there, you haven't received an invoice. Uh, it doesn't apply to you. Uh, we usually populate that information here for those facilities. So basically half of the previous year emission was paid and then they pay you the delta because they paid in advance. Um, let me delete this. So if you report, our deadline is the 19th of March. If you report after the deadline, basically the tool is going to ask you to uh, put a postmark date. As far as charging late fees and determining that your report is late, we look at the postmark date on the envelope. Uh, or if you hand deliver it, there's going to be a stamp on the package with a date. Based on that, we determine um, you know, uh, your late fee charges. But uh, before you submit, you kind of need to anticipate when it's going to be postmarked. And you enter that date, let's say, um, I usually go with uh, April uh, uh, 1st, but I guess it was a holiday for the April 2nd. So you know it's going to be postmarked that, you know, that day. So you enter that, the tool is going to calculate automatically how much your late charges is going to be. So when you cut a check and you know you're going to be late, you got to you know, include that late charges in your payment. And let's say, and that was the case, I'll be late. I entered uh, April uh, 2nd there. It's going to add up my whole uh, emission fees to uh, $10,000, and I press save. Data validation, I'm okay with that. And you go to the submission. See, I have errors of zero and warnings of one. As I indicated with warnings, it, it's going to let you submit this button is going to appear to you. If you had any errors, you're not going to see this submission button. So that's a you know, trigger point that if you don't see submit button, that means and there is an error that you need to address. And um, once I press this submit button, um, basically electronic submittal phase is going to be done. As I indicated, the tool gets locked on you. Uh, if this, if you need to make changes, uh, let's say you figure out that the, your facility contact needs to be changed. If it's before the reporting deadline, you need to um, contact us. We can unlock it. After reporting deadline, we cannot unlock it. So in that case, you need to submit amendment, which I guess if you go to our web page, there is a one-pager uh, explanation of you know step-by-step -step instructions on how to amend reports. And once you, let's say, you know, um, you know, submit it, you go to the print facility report, and Eugene uh, uh, went through what documents need to be physically mailed to us. So those information are mostly, you know, signature sheet, make sure you sign it. We get signature sheets that are not signed. Signature sheet needs to be signed. That's why it's called signature sheet. Status update, these two, and uh, all these summaries are required to be submitted. Um, and then to do that, you press the print, you know, button here. It's going to populate a PDF. You can save it in your computer for your record too. But uh, I would like to show it to you. That's why I didn't submit it. 
if you don't submit the electronic, when, we, when you print it, this watermark is gonna be there. So we're gonna know that it wasn't reported or wasn't submitted electronically. And the reason that we want this report to be generated after you submit the report is once it's not submitted, you can always go back and change it, right? So that's why you, make, you need to make sure the report is electronic submitted, then you report this page. And I guess with that, uh, you know, once you submit the report, you're done and you cut a check uh, and, you know, and close it with a payment and uh, Eugene touched on, you can pay electronically. Uh, and there is a link on our webpage that um, you know, gives you instruction on how to do that. So I guess with this, um, I guess one more thing I always forget. Um, here is, um, we always talk about the feature that allows you to upload uh, documents. Uh, we recommend you use it. Uh, to access it, you need to uh, click this uh, upload button with an arrow up here. What it's gonna do is, it's gonna prompt you to this page which allows you to browse in your computer and attach a document. Um, I guess I'm gonna use uh, uh, one of the files that are available in uh, the documents here. So you can describe it, uh, let's say it's a source disk that you're gonna be using, it's the safety data sheet that you'll be using. You can enter, you know, define it, let's say I put ACS. That's the you know, primer. And um, about these dates, validation from is basically you indicate from this date, I want to use this document for my reporting. So, and it has to be a current date or a later date. You cannot go back. As you see, that's required. So you're gonna indicate from this point of time, I wanna use this type of document. And, uh, but most of the time, let's say you wanna continually, continuously use it. Then you leave the uh, valid two empty. So that means that even next year, you go to here, because it keeps track of all the documents that were uploaded. Let's say there is a document here, it was a source disk, it was added January 31st, 2019, and it was uh, valid from um, January 1st through uh, January 1st, 2021. Usually source disks are done on a regular basis. That can be a, a good thing to put as valid too, because you know within, let's say, if you're doing source disk every three years, you know it's coming up. And then next, the, when you report and the, you have a source disk, that's a good reminder that it's not gonna show up. But when you open it, leave it open, it's basically every year you're gonna see it unless you're limited to that day. And one other thing, um, I guess with you know, valid from, I guess it can be you know, any date, even I can go in the past, I guess. I um, you know, mistakenly you know, said you cannot go back. That's, I guess, thinking about source disk, you know, I was thinking about another policy we had. But, um, you can put any dates. So basically, you set the date. So from that date on, any other reports after that date that you open, this document is gonna show up. So I'm gonna press upload. Um, and I guess there is a size limit. I guess the document I was trying to upload was, uh, um, I guess, uh, bigger than you know five megabytes. So you need to you know, keep that in mind that uh, all you can document as many as document you would like, but it has to be five megabytes and less. But I guess you see, uh, you know, I have a document that was already uh, uploaded there, and if you need to uh, change them, you can, you know, press the modify, which is gonna allow you to update these information, and if you need to delete it, you can delete it. And with this, I guess I'd like to uh, conclude the demonstration section. Uh, any questions? All right, I guess uh, there is no question. Okay, sorry. Actually, my phone is. Oh. I get confused here. 
Hi, my name is Bill Lamar. I'm the Executive Director of the California Small Business Alliance. Uh, I have a question here. I'm a little confused. On your slide 15, <coughs> what's new this year, you cite CARB's Criteria Pollutant and Toxic Emissions Reporting Reg uh, under AB 617. And if I, re as I read their regulation, there are four criteria uh, for reporting. Mm -hmm. And the last one is a facility that has one or more permits to operate issued by an air district, emits any criteria pollutant or, or tack as defined in this article and is located within the boundary of a community selected uh, by CARB uh, pursuant to health and safety code and so on. Any pollutant. But, right. your, but your slide six uh, seems, to, seems to say that you have uh, who, should, who should file uh, greater than four tons a year of VOC or NOx uh, or a facility that's subject to AB 2588, right. which, if I remember correctly, their priority score is 10, right, on that. Right. So, so just uh, to make the distinction between the two programs, under AER, that slide covers who's subject to our AER program. As far as AB 617 is concerned, it sounds like you are following the reg. What they adopted in December does have that fourth criteria that specifies if you're a facility located in an AB 617 community. However, that's actually being worked out by the state right now. They're modifying that fourth criteria. So that's not going to apply anymore. Uh, it's just kind of up in the air. They the, have a the different fourth one won't. I'm sorry? The fourth one The fourth won't. one won't, yeah. Oh, and so okay. that's it. they have a different uh, rule development process, although they adopted their reg in December in front of their board. Right. Uh, they have um, chance opportunities, 15-day, 30-day. In some cases, it may go longer. Changes that they can make to uh, their regulation as long as it's still in the scope of either their amendment or, in this case, it's a brand new regulation. So. Um, if you wanted to follow that, you can go on their webpage. They have, I think they're going to be releasing a new draft version soon. Yeah, they told, uh, they, we, we testified and then also submitted written comments uh, both to your agency right. and the CARB on that, uh, actually uh, opposing that, that, that small uh, uh, of, a, of a reporting requirement. Correct. Uh, and they, they also, I believe they said that uh, 15 days wasn't necessarily 15 days until right. they, they reconciled that. So right, so right now you're, you're looking at a, at a, a four ton uh, or greater than reporting requirement. Well, are you talking about our program, the AER program, or? Well, you, you cited CARB's reg in this. Right, so for CARB's reg, um, just as far as AB 16 is concerned, uh, the changes to our program in the reporting tool, what you'll see is just two things right now. Um, you're going to have an identifier for whether or not you are identified by us subject to AB 617. Right. Uh, and we're just using the available data that we could look at in order to determine whether or not you're, you know, triggering 250 tons per year for PPE, if you're MRR, or if you're AB 258 high priority. That fourth category, category is still up in the, or criteria is still up in the air. Okay, so that's, so what that's we a question mark then. That's a question mark. So right now in the tool you'll see, or other, right? Uh, once we determine and we get word from the state on what that fourth criteria is going to be, uh, we'll obviously we'll change that identifier in the tool. But as far as AB 617 goes, everything's business as usual. Um, how our tool is set up, how, if you report in that tool, you will be in compliance with the state reg. Uh, and it won't, it'll be a little bit more different um, maybe in two years. There's different requirements that kick in for 2020 data. Right. Right. And so, Obviously, for our next workshop, I'm, I'm sure we're going to elaborate a little bit more on AB 617. Just right now, it's still kind of like in its new stages. Um, but again, just for assurance on the reporters end, as long as you're reporting through the tool, you will be in compliance with the state reg. Okay. Thank you. Yes, Go hi. Um, my name is Mireille. I'm co I know I'm uh, from Loma Linda University. Um, I have a question. I have some equipment that I got, uh, you know, AQMD permit last year, but it's still under constructions. 
So it has a permit. Do I wait until you know the equipment is under operation, or should I go ahead, you know, add it to emission sources? I guess as far as uh, if the equipment is under construction, so you're not going to generate any emissions. But uh, you can be proactive. You can add them and uh, add them to the tool for next year, so you you know you don't forget to report them. But uh, when you define, so basically what you're going to be doing is add it as a source where you report the operation status, you know, call them not in operation. And then there is a common box you can explain. It's currently in the, you know, uh, construction phase. And uh, you can add it that way. Any more questions? That uh, will, you know, conclude our, uh, you know, demonstration and presentation. Uh, this phase of our uh, workshop today. Now we have uh, our staff with computers. So if you need, uh, you know, hands-on training or you know, one-on-one -on -one sessions, I guess you're welcome to come to the front. Thank you. And just one last reminder: if you can't stay here to ask questions or talk to our staff or work on the computers. Um, Please don't hesitate to use our hotline uh, and also our email address. Um, we respond fairly quickly, so just make sure you know that that resource is also available.